Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles, and welcome to Angelo Robles' podcast, hosted on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, Stitcher, and other platforms. Also, if you're watching via YouTube, our YouTube channel and subscribe is very simply Family Office. We have a wonderful session today titled Next Gen Family Office, a personal journey from finance to Playboy to oil and gas to gaming and esports. That means we have a lot to cover. And we have a great guest, Natalia Sokolova, founder of SGG World LLC. It's always a little extra special to have on someone who's a generational family member, but someone who also is incredibly active in the family office, in investing, and broadly has such diverse opinions, being born in Russia, uh, coming to the U.S. to be educated, for the most part at a really young age. We're going to talk about that. So there's lots to discuss, especially on investing in private companies, direct investing, and a lot of opportunities now during COVID. Natalia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here, Angelo. It's always a pleasure to give people a little bit of context. I've known Natalia for probably about seven or eight years. We're incredibly active in California. She's always been a wonderful guest of many of our programs in LA, but also in Florida and occasionally New York. I always enjoyed her company, her intellect, uh, and always learn, especially how generational families, especially globally, are investing. She also was kind enough to introduce us to a couple of guests, one specifically that we had on as a guest, also representing an international perspective as a family member and an investor. Uh, that was Mr. Soriano. That was a lot of fun. That was probably about six, seven weeks ago. Well, we have a lot to discover. I don't think in my five months doing this near daily since COVID that I had someone quite from your perspective, born in Russia to a successful entrepreneurial family uh, and one that effectively created a family office. So you could talk a little bit about the early years and your indoctrination, so to speak, into the world of oil and gas and finance. Yeah, thanks, Angela. So uh, my, my father and his identical twin happened to be pretty close to, you know, to the Russian government in their very early 90s. And uh, from there on, you know, they created uh, different businesses in manufacturing and real estate in the last 10 years uh, about oil and gas industries. So my father is a, um, a citizen of Switzerland and my uncle is Germany. So uh, it's a Swiss family office. But right now, most of the assets are in Russia and primarily focus on oil and gas. So when I was uh, 15, uh, my father wanted to, obviously I was the only child at the time, and my father wanted me to take over the business eventually. So I entered the contest in Moscow State University and at that contest picked one girl and one boy from Moscow and sent them as exchange student to United States. So I was lucky enough that uh, I was one of the chosen contestants. So at barely turning 16, I came to United States to stay with a wonderful family and I uh, finished the last semester of the high school here. But it was interesting because officially not finishing high school, I uh, was accepted to University of Maryland without any high school diploma, just based upon the test results. I think it's the only case in the history of University of Maryland, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> and that's how I got to the United States. <laughs> well, it's fantastic. I mean, obviously you did very well in your studies. You were cum laude, so that's, you know, kudos and congratulations to you. Uh, did you take up business and finance? What was your interest at that young age in school? Uh, well, my interest was kind of uh, dictated where the family was going. So I did double major in business, international business. And second major is finance. And in terms of, I mean, being a teenager, being out of your country of birth, away from family, and entering college so early, my God, you had just so much coming at you. You must have been very mature. Uh, you always expressed an interest in business and your family's business, oil and gas is a very unique business. When 
did you feel like the spark of interest in the family business? And I know you would diversify your interest in years to come, but did that happen very early? You know, you don't hear many young ladies say, yeah, oil and gas, that's what I want to do. <laughs> um, I was always, I guess from a very early age, I was very curious and also kind of entrepreneurial. And also I had a lot of chance to travel since pretty young. You know, when I was um, 11, I spent two months in Japan as a peace child. That, so I was always fascinated by international cultures, different cultures, different ways of living. And I think that interest carried over to choosing my lifestyle and uh, you know where I'm at right now. Um, and so when I was 16, I was kind of just following my parents' path. I was like, this is what I am and this is what I'm supposed to do. And I was not putting that much attention to, that, to, to my future as far as me making the decision. But what's changed everything is that as soon as I got to university uh, at 16, I got in a really horrific car accident. And doctors told me that I have three days to live. And uh, the best case scenario was me with a wheelchair. So when you, when you deal with like that, when you, I just turned like a week after my 17th birthday, uh, you either, my choice was like, or I'm gonna make it through and I'm not gonna listen to what doctor says, or I'm just not gonna be here. And that was something that changed my life, changed my attitude. I put all my energy and my strength together and just made it through. My mom came over and you know, she was obviously that driving force who helped me to survive and to get better. So I think that was the major, major, major change that later on affected pretty much all my decisions later in life. Well, when I, among the two last times I saw you, one was at the event we hosted with Peter Diamandis and Tony Robbins in Santa Monica, Casa del Mar. That was about a year ago. That was August of yeah. 2019. And then I think I saw you about seven months prior at my Miami event. And what I'm basically getting at is, I guess, wow, from wheelchair, because when I saw you, you also had a broken foot. So I want to be careful not to hang out with you because things can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess when you live a full life, you know, things sometimes happen. I'm definitely a risk taker and I don't sit at home. I live my life to the fullest. That's for sure. So that's incredibly <laughs> intriguing from the family background to coming to the U.S. to go to a university of all things when you're you know, not even close to being finished with your teens to doing well in school, to having an interest in business and finance and oil and gas. But then you have this horrific injury, you're told horrific news, yet somehow, of course, you overcome it. More than overcome it, you have a very unique journey that I'm assuming led you to LA to modeling and of course it's in the title to Playboy if you could talk a little bit about that I'd love to sure, hear yeah. it <laughs> yeah so you know once you start on the recovery process fast forward three years I'm a senior in university and at that time you know I'm already admitted to my MBA program I have a I'm doing internship in the US Chamber of Commerce in Washington DC um, I, I, I won the, I, I got a job off from like 400, 400 contestant American Express financial advisors. So in my life, you know, I kind of sat and totally by chance, I was invited to participate in one of the biggest beauty contests, which has uh, two, 300,000 contestants participating in it worldwide to get into the finals. So um, Miss Russia could not get a visa. So totally by chance, I was approached and I was not interested in modeling at all. And I was approached many times. So I was like, if I can get in and walk that stage, knowing that I can barely still walk, and especially in the heels, then mentally overcame my accident. I know um, academically I did, but for mental, that was just my challenge that I had to take on. So that was the only reason I got into that contest. Next thing I know, I'm a first runner up. And next thing I know, I have a um, contract coming to me. So I come back, I had last week, uh, last couple of months maybe, and, uh, to be done with university, and I get a call. Hi, um, this is so-and-so from Playboy. Um, we saw you at the concert. would like for you to come and test with us. I had no idea what Playboy is. I basically hung up the phone. So after three times calling me, um, I was like, okay, this guy is a very persistent. I was like, okay, I am graduating. I have finals. Can you just please leave me alone until I graduate? So asked me, what date? And I give them the dates. So a week before my graduation, I have tickets in the mail to come to LA. <laughs> they didn't call me, they sent me tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, well, you know, 
I, I deserve a break. Why not to fly to LA? So I get on the plane, go there. Um, Lima picks me up, takes me to the Playboy Mansion, put me in a guest house. Uh, as soon as I basically set my bags, security comes in and asks, um, half would like you to go to the playmate of the year party with him. And I'm so close. I was like, yeah, who is half? <laughs> so that stayed with me as a joke for a number of years too at the Mimox Playboy. So while I'm there, it's kind of interesting because um, while I'm there, I get a call from my immigration attorney saying that, I'm sorry, but I can't get your visa being in finance world. And right in the same day, I was like, we can sponsor your visa. And here you go. I started doing modeling and I got my green card as extraordinary talent for modeling. <laughs> That's amazing. What a story. Yeah. What it's a, kind of interesting a... how life takes you. <laughs> for sure. Uh, Never, ever expected. And uh, that was actually an amazing experience. And you really feel like you're part of something special. Yes. And you, Efner, is such a Machiavellian, unique entrepreneur, really obviously ahead of his time, uh, broke the mold, to say the least, and unfortunately passed away, but lived a long life a couple yeah. of years ago. What I'm basically getting to is, in your interaction, was there a certain aura that he had? Was there a, a vision to look forward? Kind of, what do you feel that you take away having learned from someone who's such a, you know, an iconic figure? And yeah, the internet age kind of faded the Playboy brand a bit, but that doesn't take away from the dynamism that he had for so many decades and what the brand meant to people. Yeah, and I think that there's so much can be learned from Hap. I mean, he had a vision before anybody would accept it. He was like, I don't care, this is what I'm gonna do. He stopped at nothing. I mean, he's been through a lot of hardships to prove that, to build what, what he built. I mean, he was denied. I mean, if, if you had a chance, watch his biography. That's a really great biography that they did after he passed away. And that strength that, you know, he was a really good person. He was very kind. He really took care of, and the Playboy was really became like a, a family for a lot of girls. You know, it's like, it was the place where we were always respected, very well treated. Uh, it was, Playboy Mansion, I would say, was probably like the safest place to come to. <laughs> yes, it's always a great tourist stop, at least going by in LA. Unfortunately, I was never invited. I missed my opportunity. Oh, well. I lived there for two, two months because when, I, when the Playboy moved me to Los Angeles, they allowed me to stay for two months in the guest house until I get situated with my own place. Well, I expect nothing less. That was very kind of the team and Mr. Hefner at the time. Back a little bit to oil and gas, because we're during COVID times, especially early in COVID, there was incredible uh, tensions and issues. Uh, speaking of your home country with Russia and the Saudis, and that is actually one time where Russia had to kind of bow a little bit relative to the challenges uh, given the price of oil. I know it's not your business anymore, uh, so, you know, we don't need, I guess, a PhD thesis about it, but I would like to hear a little bit about your thoughts of that business and the dynamism that was occurring around the world and still is, but certainly was really at a unique point a couple of months ago. Well, it's still my father's business. So, and uh, if you take uh, sanctions that was in Russia for such a long time and then go into the COVID, I mean, that definitely has suffered because um, the business my family in is... Um, uh, really from exploration to development to production. And the um, investors come from Europe and a lot from Middle East. So with everything going with the sanction, they finally were able to take the projects and get everything started. And then the hot COVID hits. And so uh, right now you can't even travel. Russia is completely closed. You know, you can't even go from Europe to Russia right now. So operating any businesses is very difficult. As you know, Russia is, uh, you know, put the foot down about the prices, but what they're doing also, because um, Russia has a lot of great talent also, and I think that they will be more relying, and also don't forget that Soviet Union, everything was inside, right? So there was no foreign help, there's no uh, foreign workers. So Russian mentality is still uh, capable of doing a production and, and cartoon business based upon whatever this, the efforts and they have inside the country. So I think they're kind of like leaning towards that direction, trying to, to kind of put everything within the country. That's, that's um, in speculation, obviously, but um, um, the natural resources in Russia are obviously very strong and very rich. So 
um, but it has been hit really hard. I mean, the life there, so many people are out of work, struggling. So it's really, really hard right now. Um, and, um, you know, also I think what's going to come out of it is a lot, uh, a lot of technologies. So I was saying it's probably going to be a lot more investments into technologies on different ways to, to save the cost of extractions and production. So that's kind of what I see it's, it's leading to is uh, getting better technologies, uh, providing uh, jobs for the people inside Russia to develop those properties and see how everything will play out with the COVID. Because I, I mean, and just not me from many people that I speak to in the conferences, unfortunately, I don't think that it's going away, you know, in the next year. And even if they're gonna find a good vaccine by the end of this year, uh, a lot of people are, resilient, um, are, are against vaccines and um, we don't know if it's going to work, if it's how long it's going to work for. So to actually get rid of COVID, it might be a, a long, long term before it goes away. So we do have to be prepared in every way as possible to the fact that it's just not going away anytime soon. That's for sure. And I'll do a little bit of a sidebar comment now. Uh, especially those that are watching this on YouTube or will hear it on the podcast. Uh, we had significant hurricane and power outages in Connecticut. I have zero power. I'm at a relative's house. I don't have my normal equipment. I don't have a direct Ethernet connection like I normally do. And I think that little glitch might have been on my end, Natalia. It happened once before when I had someone else from LA on, John Amaral, who's a well-known energy practitioner. Uh, I made you a co-host. If something happens where I get disconnected, you could likely still continue on. I would broadly talk about ShareNet, Directs, gaming, et cetera. Prop, if something were to happen, you know, keep it about another half hour to 40 minutes. Feel free to engage with the chat feature. It happened once before, uh, about two months ago. So unfortunately, it might happen again. I hope not. We could always re-record privately one evening in the coming weeks. But I'll cross my fingers and hope we shall be fine. Uh, one more question on oil. I don't know as much about gas, but I believe approximately uh, per dollar, Russia and the US uh, probably produce a barrel of oil for what? Internally about 31 to $37. So they're profitable at above that, but the Saudis could do it and be theoretically a little profitable at probably like six, seven, $8. It's a tremendous advantage, uh, which is just unique <laughs> in terms of how that's plague out and what will happen. And we're not even getting into eventually the greater role of uh, green and clean energy, et cetera. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, Cyrus is definitely at a lot more advantage when it comes to uh, producing the oils and their resources are quite significant. You yeah, can't deny that. And as far as the alternative, I mean, this will be a, a long time before uh, the world will be ready to switch to alternative energy. We're just not even anywhere close to be ready for it. So the, the oil and gas will, I mean, they're probably not gonna go high, but eventually the prices you know, will increase somewhat. I mean, I'm not a fortune teller, and unfortunately I think nobody can predict what really is gonna happen in this. But it looks like they're st stabilized you know, right now at the time we're there right now. And um, at least it gives you a little bit of margin to, as you said, to, to, be, to be profitable. Given your family background in entrepreneurship and private companies, and that's the approach that you took, not a focus for the most part on public companies, let's talk a little bit about investing in private companies. It's incredibly trendy in the single family office community. And there basically is, and I'm simplifying it, but two ways you could go about it. You could basically be there's professionals with the right teams where I'm going to come in as an LP. And the advantages are ease, quality of management, perhaps past track record, or to simply be a direct investor, bypass that. Why? Because I don't like two in 20, because I want control, because I want to engage the next generation those would usually be the big three as to being a direct investor. But the challenge is, you know, do you really have the right team? Former PE investment bankers, do you have the experience? Are you compensating them properly? It's really, really hard. We had on a great guest a couple of weeks ago that basically noted in the studies that the net cost 
relative to paying two and 20 or building an internal team, the net results were approximately about the same. It's just a matter of you find it exciting, you want control and control super important and maybe involve the next generation, which is a little bit of what you went through. Uh, but I am fascinated by the inefficiencies in private markets, the opportunity for greater returns and the interplay of do I do as an LP and the professionals or do I become more of a direct investor with all the families you know around the world? What are certain trends you're seeing with that? Um, well, what I'm saying that a lot of a lot more families in the last, I would say, four years, even more so in the last couple of years, are allocating a greater percentage of their portfolio to direct investment, to private equity. Um, and, you know, as we know, there's a lot of um, uh, dry powder and they were looking to allocate it more into the direct investments. And the reason is, is because... Um, well, there are a few reasons. One is if you have second generation, a lot of them want to diversify from what the patriarchs of the family are doing. That's kind of my case, and it happens everywhere, especially you know when you have several, several children and they all want to go to different routes. That's how the family offices starts branching out and looking for other types of investments, structures, industries. But also, you know, with uh, now a day, now a day and age of technology, you really don't need to have a huge term a team of analysts and in your family office you know you have a great um, networks you have uh, capabilities of hiring outside consultant who can do way better job for you than you can do it yourself and you know like your organization like yours you know you connect top family office top people that also give you credibility when you're networking with them um, you know there goes the share net they created um, uh, took a, a founded by Raptor, Raptor Family Office. They created a platform that spats the family office that go in and it's distributed. They bad deal completely before they put on the platform. So it takes away the due diligence that you kind of need to do on the greatest scheme. Of course, you have to do your own due diligence. You can't escape that. But all the groundwork has been done and the project has been vetted. So the technology that's coming into the play in the global markets are you know, uh, improving every single day and the word is getting smaller. Uh, COVID, uh, from one side, it separated, the borders are closed, but from the other side, it actually connected more virtually the companies and the businesses. So it's kind of like you see the double-edged swords in a bit. And um, another thing in the private deals, it can be a lot more creative in structure. Uh, so you can really create something that's much more lucrative. It's a better win to win. So like in my case, when I look for a company, I'm looking, okay, they, uh, they're early stage, they don't want to give up too much equity, nor uh, you want them to give up because you want the founders to, to stay and to believe and to work as hard as they can. And they should have the big stake of their baby. So what we do is, you know, we bring our own expertise. We take obviously some, some depending on the you know, amount invested, but we also structure quite lucrative deals with royalties. Uh, with the cash flow, future, the, uh, we'll, we'll take the percentage of future cash flows. And that's uh, really um, attractive for a lot of companies and gives you a little good way to select really interesting companies to work with. That's for sure. And those are potentially some of the advantages in private, more inefficient markets, the opportunity for greater return, for control, for a say in matters, uh, with, of course, the one major negative, whether LP or whether a literally a direct investor is of course going to be liquidity. Uh, and, you know, we've had people that were more public advocates on that gave a pretty good, you know, analytical perspective of, is it really worth the so-called three or 400 basis points above public returns when you're net of fees and you look at all the negatives and that's going to depend. Yeah, if you want incredible liquidity, then you're probably going to be more active in the cash and the public markets. I get it. Although, again, for the reasons that Natalia noted and a company like ShareNet and their alignment with some other uh, forces in the community, potentially opportunities for greater liquidity uh, to address some of the issues of the challenges with liquidity. So changes and Benef beneficial opportunities, I guess you could say, are coming. Let's talk a little bit, and this relates to private companies and to COVID-19, and that is, you know, unfortunately, 
uh, some private companies and real estate as well is going to be distressed. Uh, there's owners that are like bad timing, bad industry, whatever it might be, but I need liquidity. And what I own now is not what it was pre COVID. And maybe it's down five or 10%, maybe more 20, 30%. So it creates opportunity, which we're seeing now. But look at some of the industries that are challenged from hotels. And yes, we had, you know, Soriano on, like, you know, a couple of weeks back. That's going to take a family, especially if they're a direct investor, that has the experience, the confidence, the liquidity, the internal management team and resources, and guts. Because <laughs> I don't know if that industry is going to bounce back for a long, long time. Nonetheless, distressed opportunities create an opportunity to buy something at a price that could make sense for many family offices. Are you seeing a trend to be an active? I mean, we see it in the funds. The GPLPs are raising, the GPs are raising money like there's no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, well, in, in, any problem creates opportunity. So um, I'll break it up in a couple different sections. So the stuff that was hard, hit really hard, let's take an example of senior living facilities. Uh, people, obviously people are afraid of them because that's the highest concentration of COVID cases. But right now, if you have money to allocate for the longer term play, you can buy them extremely cheap. And plus you're also getting government subsidies on those. So that's a long term, it's a really good investment because people are getting old, they're still gonna be need and will, you know, COVID will eventually go away if it's even it's gonna be two, three years. So if you have money to allocate in a longer term play, there's a great deal to be found right now. If you're looking for more immediate cash flow, then you know you see, I mean, e-commerce, e if you look at everybody knows about Peloton, Zoom, I mean Amazon, those things are skyrocketing, skyrocketing because of COVID, home installations, close of gyms, and um, every, everything is moving online. So I think um, businesses, if they haven't yet, they really should find a way to add an e-commerce aspect to their platform one way or the other, just have to be creative this time to create a better opportunities and liquidity for themselves. And in terms of given that you're global in your perspective, you have a tremendous network of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of family members and family office executives that you know in investing, co-investing, sourcing opportunity. Uh, how would you recommend someone who wants to be more active, not as an LP, but as a quote unquote direct investor, but maybe doesn't want to go it alone. They want to team up and co-invest with other families, even if it's more of a junior position, because they may not have the, the resources or the experiences doing uh, the vetting before it hits the market and negotiation and the experience of, is this a good deal? Part of it is limited because of COVID because part of the answer was getting out there and being part of the global community and meeting family offices at Davos at, you know, uh, I, I'll throw a little bit of a plug in for my company, Family Office Association, but I'm certainly not the only one. And now that plug has been pulled. How do you develop a network of relationships that you trust that you could potentially co-invest with? Well, um, family office is, uh, is a very closed in and very personal relationships. That's why I think out of the networks called probably was the biggest uh, learning curve for family offices because everything is really face-to-face -face and personal relationships, which is obviously changing right now. So if you were looking to invest in the project with the family office, without relationship, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, but if you don't have this relationship yet, don't say, okay, I lost, it's too much. You still can develop it, but they do take time. So like your organization, you're great at connecting people. Uh, other, you know, like if you're already family office, then you can look at the SharingNet and, uh, you know, um, Angels, other, other networks who provide, if you're just individual, there's a lot of Angel networks who provide also access, but you have to do your due diligence. Uh, and build the relationships because it's all about trust. And I don't know many family offices who would invest in the deal without really knowing the company or having the company recommended by somebody that done deal in the past for at least a couple of years. That's my personal experience. Yes, and that, you know, that certainly appears to be uh, the trend with that. It's, it's having 
those trusted relationships. We have one family, <laughs> I can think of them now, that basically said, oh yeah, we do co-invest and take advice from other families on direct deals. We only would like to know them for about two generations first. We <laughs> <laughs> <I love> <laughs> actually see that much, much yeah. more in Europe, like in Switzerland and okay. countries like that, where in Germany, et cetera, where it's just, they're a little bit more distrusting. They like the generational perspective. In the US, it tends to be a little bit more fast paced, fast moving, uh, a little bit more open. And yes, sometimes that probably burns people, by the way, of course, but it also allows people to be early adopters to get you know in there because sometimes the others do move a little too slowly. Now, they're gonna argue that's why they're still worth billions after generations. And yeah, they're gonna pass on things that may be great, but they're not sure. And they don't wanna take a reputational or an investment risk. And that's a choice that each family is gonna have to make. Absolutely, yes. Uh, let's talk a little bit, and this also for sure relates to COVID-19 and your experiences, as we noted in the title, in effectively gaming and esports. That was trending going back five, six, seven years ago, but it really is starting to take off now during COVID-19. I'd love to hear with your involvement with some great organizations and thought leaders uh, your opinion about the opportunities to invest in gaming and esports? Yeah, so I I kind of entered the uh, gaming and esports community about three years ago, and partially it was because my my son was gaming. I had no idea what he was doing, and I was taking his devices away. And then I realized that I I need to actually be more educated in that because I know I'm, I'm gonna it's gonna affect my relationship with my son. So. When I started looking into it, I found that it was quite fascinating. And then I met my uh, partner, Gary Kleiman, about three years ago uh, through a mutual friend. And about five, six years ago, he founded a web network. And he was a definitely a pioneer because he saw, um, you know, he actually went to the Madison Square Garden, saw the article that uh, it was full completely with somebody watching somebody streaming. So uh, it's just hard to believe that the impact of the gaming but um, you know, there's 2.7 billion people gaming every single day. So he founded a digital media platform uh, that focused on lifestyle and, lifestyle and culture of gaming, web network. So from that, you know, we saw that there is also, it's increasing every day. And then we saw that um, you know, it's, uh, gaming is not only you know, people are teenagers sitting and gaming and eating bad food. You know, last year you had uh, over a thousand universities in the United States offering a scholarship for gamers because uh, the gamers, they increase the STEM programs. So right now more and more universities are creating esports teams. Then um, people are looking for gamers to be hired because you have drones, uh, online surgeries. I mean, gaming industry is really for, you know, healthcare education. All education right now is online and how do you study? It's a gamified way of studying. So um, gaming became mainstream, I think, only about a year ago, maybe two, and it's getting more and more right now. But it's still a lot of people are kind of falling back, not trusting that industry and not understanding how huge it is and how important it is for a global economy. Realistically, what gaming is, is incentive-based behavior. And how do you change anything is by incentivizing people to change their behavior. So one of the ways to prevent the spread of COVID is, you know, utilizing it by giving incentive to people, to the network of gaming, uh, to, you know, to figure out how to basically gamify the experience, to plant trees, to, there's been apps who help to do the different research for cancer, to do different tests. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And, um, it's, it's a huge, huge industry. I mean, 75% of households in the United States has at least one gamer, which is about 215 million people. And, um, you know, there's uh, gaming is um, used for treatment of um, PTSDs. 55% of gamers are gamers with disabilities and uh, they're using gamers to cope. So the list of positive and uh, positive in fact of gaming is huge. And therefore, there lies a lot of investment opportunities when it comes to gaming industry. 
I mean, esports, yeah, um, but also outside of the esports, uh, educational, um, healthcare, military, all have different impacts of gaming in, in, the, in, the, in that industries. For sure. And I promise, audience, I am not making this up. But in my sister-in-law's home, where I am now, and my son is with me, so I have a 16-year-old and who's very active in gaming. So I hear exactly what you're saying. But I swear, uh, my nephew, so his cousin, is a little older, at a university, is part of an esports team, and literally, as I'm recording this, no joke, he's the one you may hear subtly in the background. Uh, his team is doing very well, progressing, now a little bit more capitalistic, not to some of the social causes you're noting, but potentially part of 200 of like 12,000 teams. So they're doing very well to win a $25,000 prize. So he's working very hard at winning that 25,000. I did mention this when I had Christy Kegler on discussing direct investing. It's, it's only a pinch off topic, but I think the audience will, I think, enjoy it. Uh, there's a, yeah, so some families are going to say, we want to teach the next generation to be active in direct investing, but, you know, they're trending towards things that interest them. So you might actually have some great advice with your children or grandchildren on gaming and esports opportunities in your own household and you don't even know it and i don't think they're gonna go to college graduate and just let it go yes some will of course and sure it'll have a different perspective in their life but you look at the metrics of how many younger millennials and how many Generation Z there are, along with baby boomers, those are by far the three biggest generations. Uh, and now with COVID and being in home and staying safe, it, this is a booming trend. You just have to be able to see that. Of course, there'll be winners and losers, but the bigger comment I was gonna make, if you wanna start off really, really small, direct investing, including gaming, I know, because I'm dabbling a little bit, there's a website called flippa.com, F-L-I-P-P-A, and there's others, Empire Builder, uh, but Flippa is very well known. James Altashir had the founder on his podcast and that kind of blew them up. But there's thousands of tiny companies that you could buy. So if you're a family of even some resources and you want your teenagers to be active, understanding business, finance, direct investing. You could buy companies for like 500, 1,000, 2,000, 10 to $30,000 that are net profitable. They are already net profitable. Some of them are there in gaming and esports now, and it's an opportunity to help educate and train the next generation. Might they blow that investment and your 3,000 goes out the window? Of course, they don't manage it properly. They learn a lesson and it didn't cost you a million or $2 million. It may have cost a thousand to 5,000, maybe a little more. I know it's all going to be relative. So a little off topic there, but if nothing else, maybe we should be listening, watching and learning from what our teenagers are doing, Natalia. Absolutely. And you know, like since COVID started, the, and that was statistics in April, so I'm sure the number is way higher. There was 75% increase in online gaming, according to Verizon. And one thing that most people don't know is that average age of a gamer is 37 years old. So late 30s, mid to late 30s, and 55% of parents play with their children to bond with them. So uh, also a little bit off topic, but this is something, a little message for parents who do have teenagers who play a lot and they don't know what to do and they kind of take their vices away, which I did. I would actually reconsider it because looking at my son, not only he is learning, you know, coding, uh, but it's also skills management, communication between different countries. They create their team. So every single time zone is covered. So somebody is staying on 24 seven, dealing with drama, dealing with leadership. There's so many skills learned that will be absolutely crucial when they come to becoming a you know, business, business qualities and life qualities. So I think the life school that gaming does, if you're in that world, is actually very beneficial. For sure. And a chance for, like you said, 
uh, parents to bond with the kids. And by the way, to get crushed, we're not going to win. I tried. <laughs> I, I, I'm not but trying. Hey, but there's no you way. Know, you have to let them win at something. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's certainly, it's, uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity now more than ever, and partially due to COVID, again, in gaming and esports for investors. And it does serve some other purposes, some social perspectives that you noted. And we had on some experts in ADHD a couple of weeks ago where there is a focus to have your your eyes and your brain on a screen coordinating with your hands. Now, yeah, maybe more than an hour a day may not be so great. And there are some specific games to actually help for those with some of those disorders and even anxiety. So again, as a parent and grandparent, like you noted, it may be something that we're looking down our nose, not realizing that not only is it potentially valuable, but also potentially is a tremendous uh, investing opportunity. Yeah, but, uh, but also from 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 this, you know, you also have to address, and that's kind of where we we notice that the aspect of uh, wellness and uh, healthcare and is very important because you know, like you like you say, if somebody's spending twelve hours sitting in front of the computer, it's very unhealthy. So. Uh, especially right now with COVID, when people are locked into their homes and they're spending a lot more time in front of the electronic devices, whatever they are, uh, I think there is a much be bigger need to start addressing the health and wellness aspect of gamers' lifestyles. And uh, the need is so great that um, we decided, in, in our team, we decided uh, to form a company uh, skins uh, with the Z.GG that will focus on providing value to lifestyle, health and wellness of gamers. And um, what I think that's very beneficial is um, right now, as, as I, we all know, that um, finding a job is a big problem. And um, with, I think I've heard that there's about, four, I think 40 million families cannot pay their rent in the United States and in a virtue be evicted. I mean, that's a serious wow. number because they don't have jobs. So how do you address that? How do you bring the value right now to help it? So in literally in a couple of weeks, probably within a month, we're gonna be uh, having a job portal life on the website that would, um, anybody who can upload their resume, it will scan their skills. It will also uh, say, okay, maybe you should acquire this and that skill. And it would, based upon the skills that uh, it processed, it will connect you to employers around you know, US, Canada, who are looking for this particular qualities and will connect you with this job and we'll provide the service for free because we believe in, you know, like we, we believe that before you make money, you need to provide value to people around you. And one thing about gamers, gaming is, um, you, gamer, gamers are very, what's the word? Um, uh, I forgot the word in my mouth, but you, you have to be very honest and sincere with gaming. This is not, they'll, they'll see it straight through you. It's a very smart group of people. And if you are not sincere in your dealings and if you're not providing value to them, you're not gonna have a business in this, in this space. So by providing value, by providing educational, how to do the access hiding, how to do things and providing a farmer grade vitamins and supplements who, who help you. I mean, I think that's one of the ways to help to address those issues in that community. And approximately what, about two and a half or so years ago, a game which anyone who has teenagers is gonna be familiar with, it's called Fortnite came out, that really just blew up beyond belief. And recently, I think I noticed in PitchBook, it might've been today or yesterday, it's valuation and it's owned by a company called Epic Games was about 17 billion, billion. An early investor, which wouldn't have been a lot of money, it wasn't a huge developmental cost, would have made so much money, at least on paper, yeah. relative of their investment. I'm not even gonna mention the number because it's shocking. And now again, that's like the number one out there. I get it. There's going to be those that, of course, are not doing as well or those that lose money. Uh, but there was a tremendous opportunity there. Uh, and one of the participants is asking, I'll rephrase the question a little differently. But yeah, there are people that are gamers 
uh, that are making millions and millions. Among the most popular is someone called Ninja, but there's probably 15 or 20 that make $10 million or more, hundreds that make a million to 5 million, and probably thousands that make you know early six figures. I know it's hard to believe, but on platforms like Twitch and others, there are people that watch gamers play video games and they're treated like athletes. And depending on the number of viewers you got, that engages sponsors and advertisers. And some of these people, and more than you think, it's not just one or two, effectively become influencers. And then they have significant social media channels, often seven figure followers, and they're potentially brand promoters. And you know, if any of you listen to Gary Vee and people like that, potentially leveraging via Instagram and other platforms, probably no one thought I was gonna go down that direction, and building a business, not with traditional ads, but using the new age influencers, uh, is something that is intriguing. And even though esports has taken off, actually the pricing for uh, much on influencers has actually dropped. Uh, so it is a way to potentially build brand, build awareness, make money. Uh, I, and all this just randomly came to my head. I don't know if it's a specific question or further comment you have, Natalia. No, I, I would like to add to it. So the biggest crossover is gaming and music and gaming and traditional sports. Because uh, if you go anywhere backstage, musicians will be gaming anytime they have. And uh, if you go to sports, I mean, they actually train on the devices a lot of times, you know, for their strategy, for the hand and eye coordinations. So what we see right now with the COVID, when the traditional games have been very much limited, the number of viewers for online games, for online sports has increased dramatically. And for advertising, absolutely. I mean, we'll, we'll be reaching out not only to esports people, but we're bringing uh, NFL players, uh, basketball players as part of our influencer team because they have a great following and people listen to them. You know, if you see an ad in the gaming community, you're probably going to ignore it. But if you see somebody who you follow, then you're going to listen to it. And it's really a new way of uh, doing an e-commerce space or do anything online. Taking it a bit to the home stretch, and anyone that's a live participant, feel free to send in more chat questions. Although I do want to be respectful of Natalia's time. A couple of days ago, we had an amazing, truly amazing presentation from a gentleman named John Ferresi. Uh, and it had an unusual title, basically something like, Why America Doesn't Suck. Uh, but it was a deep economic look at America and the world. Now, unfortunately, his request to do it, and he was great, was no recording. So if you're listening to this on YouTube or a podcast, sorry, that's not something that we have in the bank, so to speak. We hope to have him on. Maybe we could convince John to do a little different variation that is recorded. Uh, but he did bring up a whole bunch of intriguing things. And you having a global perspective, including born in a global superpower in Russia, uh, the interest in coming to America and the immigration of talented people, some rich, some poor. Uh, John actually noted, and I'm assuming by his comments, he probably skews on being on the conservative side, but basically said we need to be careful with immigration. There's going to be a point in a couple of years where countries are going to be fighting to get people into their country because populations are aging so drastically. Italy, Spain, Japan, to some degree China, they're actually pretty good uh, here in the U.S., but that may start to get worse. And I find the whole topic of the value of a foreigner looking at America, the land of opportunity, the land of entrepreneurialism, anything could get done. And are we closing those borders that's gonna impact us longer term? That's a great question because it's uh, from, from one perspective, of course, closing, closing borders uh, with mixed more concentration and doing everything inside the country, kind of what I was saying was happening in Russia earlier uh, in our conversation. 
but yeah, it's creating definitely a different more separation between the China and United States. But as far as for economy, I think that bringing more thing and creating more jobs for Americans rather than outsourcing them, it's, uh, it's, it's will benefit US economy in a longer term. And the dollar is still the, the strongest uh, currency in the world. And uh, it's gonna, I mean, I'm not again, I'm fortune teller, but I don't see any reason for it not to be written in the same. And partially because the attitude in America is that, you know, the American dream, if you work hard enough, if you believe in yourself, you can make it happen. And versus in other countries, it's just a little different outlook. You know, in, um, it's just like in, in it's, it, some countries like Italy, they'll take the whole month of August off because they want to enjoy their time, enjoy their life. In US, it doesn't happen. It's more almost like a workaholic country, but you actually can, if you work hard, you can really reach anything you want to reach. And I think that creates a little bit more opportunity for those who are in a lower income range, not right now, but in the longer term, to be able to get your US job rather than having it outsourced in China. Same thing with production manufacturing, moving it more into the United States. Oh yeah, I mean, that was a big issue that he spoke about, which with the supply chain issues now and the challenges of the Chinese having so much control over that, that does appear, uh, who knows, crystal ball, who our future president's going to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it does appear like there will be more uh, manufacturing coming back. And he noted that would be incredibly positive, by the way. Uh, well, it's been a tremendous opportunity to have you on. For those that would have an interest in learning more about you and looking at opportunities, co-investing, whatever it may be, how could they reach out to you and learn more, Natalia? Uh, the best way to reach me is uh, my email, which is my first name, Natalia with an I, at sggworld.com, name of my company. Uh, and I respond to all the emails myself. Great. And that's Natalia with an A, Sokolova, S-O-K-O-L-V-O-L-O-V-A. I probably have, should do that again. S-O-K-O-L-O-V-A. Hopefully I got it right. Yes. SGG World LLC. Uh, that was fantastic. It was a lot of fun. Uh, everyone, a reminder, because it was, at least for the most part, kind of an investment-centric conversation, that uh, this is really geared to qualified purchasers plus family offices, sophisticated investors that understand alternatives and the opportunity. Everyone has different risk tolerance goals, uh, you really need to do your own diligence and make your own decisions with the professionals that you outsource or are part of your team. We do this for engaging educational entertainment perspectives, but of course you have to make your own and do your own diligence and make your own decisions. As I noted, and this would be more applicable to my live audience, I'll be taking two weeks off from doing my daily Zooms. I'm working, I'm revamping the website to have it, I hope, up by next Wednesday or Thursday. It's going to be awesome. And finish that long-awaited masterclass and some other content that I'm writing. So it's been a very creative time for me. And taking that little break until August 24th when we resume. And we have amazing guests that week, like the youngest person who made a real impact in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. He's amazing, Joey uh, Krug. Uh, so just that we have a lot going on. Great guest heading into September. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, everyone, I'm Angelo Robles, the host of Angelo Robles's podcast on Apple, on Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart, and other platforms. And for the new folks listening in, day job, I guess you could say, founder and CEO at Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to families of great wealth and their family offices, providing a tremendous amount of proprietary content, uh, hosting global programming that one day will come back once COVID-19 vaccine or blows over. So that may be a while, we do understand that, but except for the next two weeks, we've been active near every day for five months hosting daily, daily Zoom live meetings for our members, providing real content with great people like Natalia today, some peer to peer, and some just me sharing my research and thought leadership. It's been a lot of fun. 
I'm very active on social media. Uh, family Office on YouTube is very easy to find me. FamilyOfficeAssociation.com, the new site, I hope, ready Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, and you can reach me at Angelo at FamilyOfficeAssociation.com. Natalia, thanks for being such a great guest. Thank you to our live audience. Look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you. Thanks so much, Angela. Appreciate having me. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.